Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost, but He brought me in. Oh, His love for me. Oh, His love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am chosen. Not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am, who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am in my Father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Welcome, everybody, to our Wednesday night Bible study, or whenever you're watching it. It's a Bible study for right now, and we're glad that you've joined us, and we appreciate you taking the time to be with us during this uh, uh, time of, uh, in, of studying the Scriptures. And I'm John Dobbs, and this is our Associate Minister, Daniel Kirkendall, and we'll be spending this time together uh, looking at the book of Philemon tonight. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. I hope you are, too, like John said. I'm thankful that you decided to join us, uh, watch uh, the Bible study tonight. We definitely want uh, we want to be more engaged than just uh, you know you're on your side of your phone or computer and we're uh, over here. We want to interact. We want to engage with you. So I encourage. What's going on? Our microphone is way over there. It is way over there. Hey, we're gonna keep recording though because it's gonna pick it up. And is it out? Where? Where? Yeah. We're good. I think that'll be good enough right there. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think y'all heard everything we said. It's good. Yeah, so we want to engage with you. I almost <laughs> looked like I was walking through the camera. But, uh, yeah, so uh, like, share. If you know somebody who could use some encouragement, uh, please uh, share this uh, video. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. Uh, but most, of, well, probably not most importantly, but pretty importantly, I, I'd encourage you to use the comment section uh, with this video, interact with one another, give us an amen, praise God, hallelujah, how are you doing, I'm from, you know, wherever you're from. Um, also, uh, the next step beyond that is to go to our website, facoc.org, number of things you can do on that website that are a blessing and beneficial to you, also uh, to us here at Forsyth Church of Christ, 
If you're a member or you'd like to give online, there's a place to do that. It's very simple, very safe and secure. Also, you can subscribe to our weekly uh, emails and the text messages, uh, text messages that come out uh, for reminders. You can get updated prayer requests. There's a lot of neat things that you can do by subscribing there. And probably the greatest blessing to all of you who are watching is the, the box under the communications tab where you can send in a prayer request. We meet weekly with our elders and uh, we pray and honor all those prayer requests. We also uh, communicate with one another if something pops up. Uh, you can do that. You can, uh, If you have a physical need, if there's something going on in your life that maybe we can help with, we definitely want to be a blessing to you, to our community. And uh, if you have a question, a Bible question, or what, what do I need to do to be saved, we can help you with that. Uh, you can just put that in that box. Again, that's under the communications tab. And so that's what we want to do. We want to connect with our church when we're not able to. Uh, right now, we're not meeting on Wednesday nights. We are meeting on Sunday mornings on campus at 10 o'clock. Uh, there's an online uh, version available uh, of that. But this is really kind of our, our Wednesday night right now. We want to stay connected. And so this is, we're in the middle of a series here uh, called The Images of Christians. And for the last couple of weeks, we've... Uh, looked at the question, what does it, a Christian look like, or what should a Christian look like? And we've talked about disciples, we talked about being a, a giver, Christians are friends, Christians are ambassadors, and in this lesson tonight we want to look at an image that the Apostle Paul uses in the book of Philemon that describes Christians as those who have been reconciled. So I, I'm going to put the picture of the book, this is the book uh, that's the source uh, of this study. And we'll just go right into we are reconcilers, and this is going to be from the book of Philemon. The word reconciliation, uh, we've mentioned it, I think, every single week that we've uh, been in here. It's such a it's a, it's a, it's a neat word. It's, uh, it's one that we don't use probably in our everyday language, but it keeps popping up in this image of a Christian series. Uh, one reason is it's central. Uh, it's, it's a central understanding within the gospel. Part of the good news of Jesus is that because of his sacrifice, we have been reconciled to God, overcoming the separation that we suffered due to our own sin. And since we have been reconciled to God through Jesus, we are actively seeking to be ministers of reconciliation. Yes, and so I don't know how many Christians actually think of themselves as ministers of reconciliation, but that's what we are because we are reconciled to God and we're trying to help other people be reconciled to God. But in addition to that, there are all these relationships, and it's such a needed topic in our world today. We live in such a polarized and divided yeah. time, uh, divided between nations, between races, between ethnic groups, between political parties, uh, and it spills over into relationships in our home, in our church, in our community, our workplace, and I think Christians are often called upon to act as reconcilers, helping bring people together. And in that way, we're following God's lead. He's the one who first reached out to us and now uh, teaches us to reach out to other people. And the book of Philemon is a great case study in helping to bridge the gap and bring people back together when there's been a disruption. Um, as we read through this uh, verse by verse, as we go through tonight's lesson, I do want us to recognize that there's a, a little bit of the background in the ancient world, the New Testament times, many people, including some Christians, had slaves of various categories uh, that experienced widely different conditions. And uh, Jesus and the apostles, as they taught, they expected the humane treatment of all people. And so we, uh, we promote that, and that includes slaves. I, I don't want to gloss over the... Uh, terrible condition and practice of slavery. Uh, in New Testament times, it was so common that Paul wrote about it and talked about it as, um, as sort of a, a part of everyday life. And so uh, as a Christian living in that culture and at that time, uh, he taught principles that really would eliminate slavery if they were all followed. But, but that's the right, Philemon writes, uh, as he writes to Philemon, he's writing into that context that we've been talking about. And uh, it appears that Philemon had a slave whose name was Onesimus, and Onesimus has run away. And when he ran away, he, he met up with 
and we don't know how, providentially, I would say, met up with Apostle Paul, and he became a Christian. And so Paul is writing to Philemon to say, Onesimus is coming home. And how we deal with this is a part of the gospel. It's a part of reconciliation. And so that's the setting of this little short uh, letter. It's not really a letter. It's more like a postcard, 35 (laughs) verses. Uh, So if you have your Bible out, or uh, we're going to make our way through all 25 verses of Philemon and talk about uh, reconciliation. Uh, What are some ways we can follow Paul's example and be ministers of reconciliation in our own home and church and community and world? We want to take this ancient message and bring it into today. What what kind of qualities uh, do we have? How can we follow this example? Well, that's definitely what we want to look at. And the first way that we can follow this example is to begin with a warm and a humble spirit. And so I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. And you can hear um, how, how Paul's addressing with a warm and a humble spirit. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia and our sister, uh, Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the introduction. This is... Uh, kind of the first impression here. And so you want to notice how Paul is addressing these people that he obviously cares uh, deeply about. He calls himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He he refers to Timothy as as his brother and Philemon as a dear friend and Aphia, the sister, and Archippus, the fellow soldier. And none of these terms does Paul say, hey, I'm talking. Everybody needs to listen. Or I'm an apostle. You know, I have the authority here. You have to listen to me. He doesn't do that. He comes with this warm and a humble spirit. And I think it's something that we should emulate because that's the image of a Christian. Each one demonstrates humility, friendship, connection, and care. You know, I think that's such a good a good starting place because in today's world, it's so much. Everything is so loud and commanding, mm-hmm. and I'm right. And if you don't agree with oh, me, man. then we can't be friends. And it's it's all the things that draw us to talking about reconciliation. And so it's, it is a great spirit. And Paul in 2 Corinthians kind of has, after pleading with them, finally comes to a point where he says, look, I am an apostle. I'm going to have to come there and enforce what I'm saying. Uh, he doesn't do that with Philemon. No. He's, he's got this humble spirit. And I love that uh, about Paul. Uh, and, and in verse 3 is a common greeting in a lot of Paul's letters. But I don't want us to let that commonness cause us to overlook some really important terms here. And I want to mention four important truths for reconciliation just in verse 3 where he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, grace empowers all relationships because it recognizes and offers forgiveness. It, it, it's common ground to say that you know we have grace means that we, you know, we do have shortcomings, we do have struggles, but through God's grace, we're going to overcome those. And peace. Peace is the goal of every relationship when there needs to be reconciliation. Paul's about to enter into a discussion where he wants there to be peace between Onesimus and Philemon, and he's going to talk about that in such a lovely way that it kind of helps them see the possibility for that to happen. Grace and peace, and God is our Father. And if God's our Father, then we're brothers we're together, yeah. and sisters. And, and so uh, he's already mentioned some brothers and sisters here. And so that's what the connection is. And the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, as Christians, living in submission to Jesus. And so he's our Lord. And so what he wants for us is what we desire for us. And so in just a, few, just a sentence of a few words, Paul unearths some principles here that will help them uh, to be reconciled. Yeah, so, and, and further down, just following that in verses 4 through 7, the next way that we see that we can be ministers of reconciliation is to notice the good in other people. Sometimes you have to try kind of hard to do that, you know. Uh, sometimes you have to get your own self out of the way to notice the good in other people. And so I want to read what Paul says here in verses 4 through 7. It's, he says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. I would love it if somebody said that to me. I mean, it's just a nice thing. I always remember you when I when I when I say my prayers, and th- and I'm thankful to God for you because I hear about your love for all His holy people and your faith in Lord Jesus. In verse six, 
I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing that we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. And there are some good things that he points out um, you know, about his friends and his, and his, uh, his Christian family here. And the first thing he says, he's thankful for them. I thank God every time that I remember you. When I say my prayers every night, you're in those prayers. He says, uh, I'm grateful for who you are. I'm thankful that we have this relationship. They love all the holy people. They have this common faith in Lord Jesus. They're partners um, in this faith. And just like that, we should share in the good things for the sake of Christ. And this love gives us joy and encouragement. And also he says, you have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. And I'm going to tell you something, John. This is not on the script, but some refreshment from all the stuff that's been going on this year would be just wonderful. And so um, my heart needs refreshing uh, yes. from time to time Amen. also. Yes. And he's not just flattering. You know, it, this is not for a formal um, address. It's it's heartfelt. He was laying his, his heart out for Philemon and for everyone to see. So the question I, that I begin to ask myself is how often do we make this effort? How often do I make this effort to speak words of blessing and encouragement in other people's lives? I think about how it would make me feel as I read this. And you know, then I want to turn that around and say, hey, you know, I can make other people have these good feelings and see the good in them. How many troubles and hurts could I avoid if I practice expressing uh, these good blessings to the people around me? Yeah, I, I love that. You know, you've refreshed the hearts yeah. of the Lord's people. And that tells us, Philemon, what kind of person Philemon mm-hmm. is, what kind of leader he is in the church there. And it, it gives us a, an insight into why Paul is so uh, attuned to Philemon and addressing this because of the kind of person that, that he is. I love that, that whole idea. All right, we're going to move to the next thing we notice about being a a minister of reconciliation is that we make an appeal on the basis of love. Let's look at verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Remember, he is an apostle. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul. Uh, here's how I'm coming to you. I'm not the apostle. I'm not writing, you know, to demand anything. I am writing as Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. In verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful to both you and to me. And so when love is our appeal, we have a greater chance of bringing about reconciliation. Uh, it would be easy to hear two people who are having a discouragement or discussion and, and maybe we're on the outs with each other and tell them, you do this and you do this and, and think that if they both do what we tell them, then it'll all work out. But here Paul's appeal is not to say, here's what I'm telling you to do. It's that I love you. I think you can see how love can make a difference in this situation. Uh, Onesimus is a runaway slave who's become a a Christian, and uh, Paul apparently has helped him to do that. And so Paul makes a play on his name. It's not as obvious in English, but uh, in the Greek, Onesimus means helpful or beneficial. And notice that he says here, formerly he was useless, but now he's become useful. He's living up to his name now. And so... Paul kind of makes a play on terms there, uh, on his name. But this appeal is made uh, in love rather than authority. It's He appeals to love rather than social status. He didn't say, now I know that you're a wealthy uh, slave owner and businessman and church leader, but, you know, and so, you know, Onesimus is just this lowly guy. He didn't say that. He, he's bringing them together in Christ as as equals, as people who are both brothers. And we're going to see that. Uh, being developed along the way. He's not just a runaway slave. He's a uh, uh, someone who's become useful. He said, he became my son while I was in chains. So, it, you know, here's an apostle calling a runaway slave his son. That tells us the power of reconciliation. And we hope Philemon will see it that way. Paul's appealing to his heart. And I think that teaches us about reaching out to people as individuals, as humans, 
uh, not thinking, am I above them in social, you know, or am I economically more powerful or whatever kind of things that divide people. Um, here's a person who is, who is a human being that we can love with the love of God. And that's the, that's the thing that's going to really help people come together. Yeah, you know, reconciliation breaks down those barriers. I mean, we see it break down between slave and, and, and owner, and, you know, it's based on, on this idea of love, and, and this, Paul even calls it like a family, like a son and, and a brother, and it's a really neat thing. But, you know, he, the next thing we want to look at is his appeal to Philemon. He does it as a, as a friend in verses 12 through 16, and we know that friendships are primarily based on, on trust, common ground and, and trust. And so he can go to Philemon and he can, he can say this. So listen to what he says here in verse 12. After he does this whole introduction with him, he says, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would seem voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. And so Paul, um, he appeals to the friendship of Philemon. It's very personal there, and he bases, he bases this request um, you know, this acceptance that he has on the friendship that they've ch shared over a very long time. We have, Christians have the opportunity to bring about peace and reconciliation and break down those barriers that are in the way through the friendships that we have established as Christians. Paul reflects on his friendship pretty vividly here with Philemon and talks about it with Onesimus in the circle of, of friends and he speaks in a matter-of-fact way. The truth is, according to Paul, Onesimus is valuable as a man and as a brother for both of them, Paul and Philemon. He's a slave, but he's more than a slave, is, is what he says. And throughout the whole Bible, we see this idea of friendship. Um, the, the Proverbs has, it says plenty about friendships. There's other stories of the Bible, David, Jonathan, Paul, and Barnabas. The influence and strength of a good friend makes a huge impact on being able to reconcile differences. Yeah, and, and this idea of friendship and, and brotherhood and the, the relationships that have been, that Paul keeps emphasizing, you know, like a son, like a brother, he's tearing down all the walls yeah. that keep them, uh, that keep them apart. And, uh, and so I do, that's why I said earlier, a lot of the things that Paul teaches will uh, demonstrably uh, eliminate slavery. And, uh, but, uh, but he's working within his culture to try to bring about this reconciliation. That appeal of friendship is so strong. And then uh, connected to that is this, um, the idea of assuming responsibility to be a bridge. Because Paul, he kind of steps into the gap there a little bit more. He's, if you notice, he's just getting closer and closer and closer to Philemon. And now he's going to kind of get really, really close. Uh, let's look at verse 17. He says, so... If you consider me a partner, welcome him, Onesimus, as you would welcome me. Now think about that. What kind of joy would they have at receiving Apostle Paul back, you know, to, to visit with them out of, out of prison and free? He says, I want you to, to, to welcome him like you'd welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or if he owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay back, not to mention that you owe me, your very <laughs> self. <laughs> so he's really going to get here close to Philemon in this uh, uh, thing. And so sometimes what's in the way of reconciliation is a debt. Maybe it's, uh, it could be money. It could be a memory of some wrongdoing, uh, some shortcoming, some bad impression that was made. It, there's just something that's in the way of people really being able to come together. And a third party can come in, a reconciler can come in and say, look, and vouch for the other person and say, look, if he owes you anything, you can charge it to me. And a friend can step into that gap. And so Paul says, uh, you know, you owe me. And he's sort of banking on the years of friendship he had with Philemon to get a path back 
for Onesimus. He, he's really putting himself on the line here. Mm-hmm. So you can see that he really does love Onesimus. He really does believe that he's become a new person, a new Christian. He really has accepted him with all the walls broken down. It's really a beautiful thing to see him kind of step into that and say, okay, Philemon, I'm not going to make you do it, but I'm I'm taking away every objection you could possibly have. That's right, yeah. I'll cover for you if, <laughs> the, if something comes up. You know, he just he does. He just lays himself out there and uh, puts Onesimus and Philemon's relationship above his very own circumstances. And mm-hmm. and I think it's great the way that he um, expresses this to Philemon in this, in this letter. And he does something that I have a hard time doing sometimes. You know, I have a hard time delegating. Uh-huh. And as ministers of reconciliation, we should be confident in other people. You know, I kind of feel, you know, if you want it done right, just do it yourself sometimes. And I... I I feel, you know, I feel kind of ashamed to uh, to say that, but I love the way that Paul expresses the confidence in Onesimus. And he does it here in verse 20 and 21. So I'll read that. It says, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And so he, he makes this long 18-verse uh, request. He says, I know you're going to do this and even more, so I have confidence um, in you. Uh, so in the end, when it comes to helping others reconcile their difference or, or bring harmony to a damaged uh, relationship or situation, uh, it's going to be up to those people to decide how they want to handle this. Um, but with encouragement from a friend, oftentimes they will make a good decision. You know, you're right. I do need to forgive them. You're right. I do need to pay them back. You know, or you're right. I do need to apologize if we have a friend and, you know, we express confidence in people to be, uh, you know, to, to, to realize the importance of good, healthy relationships. Part of the description of love is that it believes all things. We believe in the best of other people and that will help everyone to be their best. Mm-hmm. I love how he's earlier he said, you know, you've refreshed the the spirit, the hearts of the Lord's people. Now here he says, now refresh my heart. That's right. That's the only thing I ask. Just refresh my heart. So. <laughs> Paul's he he's a master here. He's not manipulating no. uh, Philemon, but he is making his case as strongly as he can. And he goes a step further. And that is, he affirms that this our ongoing friendship is not based on your decision. And so he, he, he goes on to say, uh, you know, he said previously, you know, I know you're going to do this and do more. But then he goes on to say in verse 22, One thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Uh, Epaphras, uh, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, and Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. And he says, I want, you know, he expects to come. And he doesn't say, now, if you'll do what I've asked, then I'm going to come see you. He doesn't lay out any kind of boundaries or rules. He just says, I'm coming to see you. And, and so, in a way, to me, he lets Philemon off the hook of his judgment and just says, you do the right thing. He's put it all before him. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't wait to hear his judgment on the situation with Onesimus. He assumes his friend's going to do the right thing. But he appears to affirm that this friendship is in place. No matter what happens, even if Philemon and Onesimus are not reconciled, uh, this friendship is expressed. He names all these other people and says, you know, we're coming. And, uh, you know, he just affirms that friendship. And I think we have to be careful about in this idea of reconciliation that, you know, we make our effort and say it doesn't work out, that we're not saying, you know, we're cutting off all of our friendship ties because this didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we're... Uh, we're 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 going to remain friends because there might be other opportunities. You know, Paul might if this didn't work out, Paul might have another opportunity to talk to him about Onesimus. So, uh, so I kind of I, I like how he ends this sort of without any kind of wedge or turning of the screw or anything. He says, "I know you're going to do the right thing, and then I'm going to come see you." Yeah, and I think it's neat the uh, the the friends that they have together. And like you said, he's not manipulative, but he is pretty persuasive here. You know. They just say, you know, remember these guys that we know together? They probably, you know, they probably <laughs> be ready to reconcile. And so, you know, it's it's part of a healthy spiritual life, and that's the that's the other thing. That's the other benefit of reconciliation. It's part of a healthy spirituality. Verse twenty five says, "The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit." Reconciliation is not it's not really optional, man. I mean, like if we 
resist reconciliation as Christians, it's going to damage our spirituality, either in the short term or even worse in, in, in the long term. Um, but this matter is one that God leads us to. It's one that he actually provided an example for. And he laid himself on the line so that he could be reconciled to us. And it's one that will benefit our spirit when we emulate that reconciliation, that, that minist- we're ministers of reconciliation whenever it's possible. It's healthy for our own spirit. And so that gets us all the way through uh, the 25 verses. I think there's some, um, there's some amazing lessons here. Uh, and as we close, you know, this brief letter demonstrates the kind of spirit that's needed so that those who have been divided can come back together. And you mentioned it at the beginning. is you can, uh, Division is not difficult to find. Reconciliation is a lot more difficult to find, and we need more of it in this world. And so the question or the challenge for everyone listening, and even for you and I as we're reading this, is what ways can we be reconcilers? What can we do to help our friends, um, our communities, our families, our churches, uh, where we can be reconcilers and help build those bridges and and reharmonize the damaged uh, relationships. And the other thing is to think about, you know, as, as we close this out, uh, something to think about is um, somebody specific. Is there anyone in our own life that we need to be reconciled to? And what can we do to pursue uh, reconciliation with that person? Uh, this is a great question. It's something to really contemplate, not just hear and, yeah. and dismiss, but really think about uh, about that. Now, there are two more images in this series of of Christian images that we're going to to look at. So next week, we'll look at another one uh, and uh, see what we can learn from the scriptures there. I do want you to feel free to contact us at facoc.org. Click on the communications for prayer requests, for Bible questions, information on how to become a Christian, how to start this Christian journey. We're certainly here to help you. Maybe... Some of you have have not really made the first steps of this Christian journey. You really are just hearing about it or maybe more concerned about it because of what's going on in our world. But uh, we welcome that interaction and would love to talk with you uh, about uh, just some of those initial steps about believing in Christ and turning away from your sin, being baptized to to begin that new life. Uh, But whatever we can do to help you, we certainly would, would like to communicate with you both uh, at facoc.org on our Facebook page, uh, you know we always have something going there. So, uh, so thank you again mm-hmm. for for being here with us. We're going to pray together to end this uh, this time together, and and uh, at the end of that prayer, uh, I'd love for you to type Amen or Hallelujah or Praise the Lord or or. Uh, Try to do better the next time, <laughs> yes. or or whatever you want to type there. And that way, everybody can see, you know, that we're all watching this together. And I think there's some some value in there's that. Definitely value in that. So, mm-hmm. all right, so let's pray. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for your Word. Thank you for the way that it shows us how to live our everyday life. Would you help us to be humble enough to be devoted to learning and following after Jesus Christ? Think of this marvelous example of Paul and Philemon and Onesimus and, and uh, even living in a different culture and time. They demonstrate for us such powerful principles of reconciliation. Help us to be reconciled first to you and then to others in our circle of friends and then help us to help the world to become reconciled to you as well. Thank you so much. For, you've blessed us in so many ways. And we're so thankful. Help us to follow you in every way. In the name of Christ we pray. And all who agree said, Amen. 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 Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't burn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. When I was 
was your foe, still your love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't burn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. All the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. Chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't burn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. All the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God.